I want to discuss today uh, something that I um, generally I try to to uh, sense what are a, a points that would be uh, helpful for our continuous uh, progress. And uh, sometimes these things are involved has color to our philosophy. And sometimes they are quite simple points, but they're equally important. And uh, if we have a uh, better perce- perception of what's going on, it can open up our minds, it can open up our hearts, and thus uh, result in much b- better success. I want to discuss with you the significance of your being in a, in a yeshiva environment. Yeshiva environment is not just the fact that there are sforim and there are shiurim classes and you're being taught and you learn and you know and you have Rosh Yeshiva. Yeshiva environment is also all the people that that learn together with you. All the students in the yeshiva are part of the yeshiva environment. In general, in terms of learning, we've discussed many times, and I want to focus in, what is Torah learning? as opposed to secular learning. In secular learning, you isolate a point and it's voice training for this. You can isolate a point and speak almost hypothetically doesn't have to be a reality. Like, say, mathematics, you don't even talk about real things. You just talk uh, numbers. Or any science or even history. This is what happened. Whether it's real or not real, what is its significance? It, it doesn't matter. This, this, uh, Study this story. Toyota is a totally different process of learning. I'll give you an example. When the Torah tells us that if you find a lost article, you should return it to its own. I'm just giving an example which I assume all of you are familiar. I've seen it in the Chumash. It says that if you find something, you should not disregard it. You should not turn away from it. You have to pick it up and then you have to find the owner and return it to him. That's part of your obligation. How was the Torah present this, this thing? It doesn't present it in abstract terms. You know what I mean by abstract terms? If you find a lost article, um, you have to return it. It says, if you fr- if you find something that you fr- that you have lost, and you don't know who he is, you sh- you, you cannot ignore it. You have to take it in and look for your haver and and return it to him. And if he's not if he's not close, you should inquire about him and so forth. Hold it for a while. All kinds of different different uh, aspects, different details. But the entire episode is described in practical, in real terms. Uh, when the Torah speaks about the dinim of 
of a shomer. You know what a shomer is? A shomer means um, someone who watches something for safekeeping. You ask somebody to guard something for you. So there are different kinds, different categories of obligations, different kinds of shomer. It does not say, if it gives him an article to watch, you know, th- these are the laws. It says exactly, he gives him, gives him a donkey, he gives him a cow, he gives him a, um, a, a keili, he gives him money. It speaks about exact and actual cases. The reason for this is besides that these details actually teach us, teach us, give us a lot of insight and teach us a lot about the, the cases, the, the, the laws, but more importantly, as far as we're concerned, is because the Torah is actually speaking about reality. It's not taking things out of reality. It's not abstracting things. And the reason it is not abstracting things, let me explain to you what's behind this. Taking the example of that we are talking about, you'll find the lost article, you have to return it. Why do you have to return it? What's, what, what's in it? Well, you could say, listen, you found it's not yours. It's not nice for you to keep it. It's appropriate, it's decent, it's morally correct for you to return it. In other words, everything focused on the person himself. This is the right thing for you to do. But this is not what the Torah is about. The reason that you have to return this article taking in, in, a broad, in a broad sense is the following. The whole world belongs to the Creator, to Hashem. And He gives everyone what is His, what is due to Him, what belongs to Him. And if you find an article that Hashem had given to someone else, you should know it's not yours. And yet, why did I find it if it's not mine? The reason you found it is because Hashem is giving you the opportunity to pick it up, guard it for this other person, and return it to you. Because he wants precisely this particular activity. In other words, the entire episode is a reality. It's not just talking about a moral correctness. Is describing a total, a total situation. And the, in other words, the reason you have to return it is precisely the way the Torah says. If you find an article that your friend lost, exactly the same thing. Not because it's not yours, but because it belongs to your friend. And if you found it, the whole thing exactly fits into the, it describes the whole situation. If not, if one of these conditions is missing, there's no more reality. There's no, no, nothing to talk about. This is the meaning. This is Torah. This is this is what you're learning here. <clears throat> and and so therefore, when you when you sit and learn, and I said, have you learn? The the learning is not. A, an abstract type of activity, except that this is the only place where I can have the opportunity to learn it. No. The reason that this is the place that you have the opportunity to learn is that this is the place that is suitable for it in every respect, both in the respect that this is, and this is where you have the teachers and you have the books, and this is where you have the entire environment, including including the, the friends that you're learning with. 
This is all part of the entire of the entire uh, phenomenon of learning in yeshiva. One of the expressions that we use in learning is one should have an open mind and one should have an open heart. And then he has a big heart and a big mind, then he absorbs learning. So one may may argue that the mind, we can understand that you have to have an open mind to be able to learn. Even though the terminology open mind doesn't necessarily fit, maybe a good memory or a strong mind, but what does open heart have to do with it? What does the heart have to do with learning? And this term, a big great heart, is even used amongst the greats when we describe some some great scholars, some great Amit Chochem, some great Rosh Hashiva, and he had a, the heart of a lion. Libek Lev What does the heart have to do with learning? There is an interesting, I'll explain this as we go along. There's an interesting um, point made um, that when you learn, let's say, you learn about Mitzia, um, you learn about Mitzia, let's say, um, in a Mafkid, right? That's what you learn, Hamafkid. What are you learning? Shaim uh, I have to take one example here. Right? Uh, what the um, when, when one person, Reuven, um, trusts Shimon with watching his article, and at the time when he gives him this article, there are certain thoughts, certain conditions that are that are taken for granted that this is what he has in mind as he's giving it to you. Okay. So the question is, let's say that the great sages and the great Chachom in the wise uh, people of the of the Talmud of the Pirushin Al they understood that this is what should be. But here you talk about a simple guy. He's a shepherd. He's watching a donkey. <laughs> Where does he come to understand all of these things? And this question is actually asked in under in, in a very complex situations. Involving with you know with, with men, women, and so forth, where do they come to understand all of these intricate thoughts that the Gemara, that the Chacham of the Gemara have thought about? So, um, so the explanation is that when a person is personally involved in something, he senses all the the ingredients of what he's involved in. When one is learning something outside, he may not think of all the of all the uh, aspects of the, of of the case. But if he is personally involved, if it touches him personally, he is sensitive to everything that that is that it entails. Which means that when the chachamim discuss these inyanim. The Chachomim are not discussing these in Yonim, um, the question of our watchmen or the question of people finding an article or selling an article, whatever it is. They're not discussing these in Yonim hypothetically, in analytical form. They're discussing these in Yonim as realities, as real. And they, but they have the sensitivity to understand what is going on in the mind and in the heart of each of the people involved. This is exactly what we learn. How 
how do they have that sensitivity? The answer is because the whole learning is done in an environment that is real, not hypothetical. And this is the this is the meaning of an open heart. Open heart means that you are in reality, you actually experience what's going on. You're not kind of isolated from the reality of the world and from life. And you're thinking in, in kind of a hypothetical in in lifeless terms. No, you were right there in the environment itself. Coming back to us, to what we're discussing here. The experience of being in a yeshiva, which means an yeshiva environment where it's not just I'm learning, but everyone around me is also learning. And everyone around me <coughs> is so to speak, my colleague in this in this undertaking. This itself is instrumental to open one's mind and open one's heart. Because this puts the the, the experience of learning into a, 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 a in, into a, 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 a real phenomenon rather than a hypothetical and, and, and um, theoretical phenomenon. It means that learning Torah is a reality. This reality is what gives us the sense that we are talking about real things. Even the intricate Svaras and the Gemara, far-fetched possibilities, they become real. Because of because we are in a real world. What is <coughs> this reality? As just as we pointed out before, the Gemara says we had. Throughout the generations, we had all kinds of great leaders. It started from Moshe Rabbein. After him was Yeshua. After Yeshua, there were other Shoifti. Then afterwards came Shmuel Hanovi. Then came Shol Hamel, then came David Hamel. We had all kinds of, 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 of great leaders. And the Gemara says, one club. And then there was a yifta through all kinds of different things. And the Gemara says, one all, all encompassing rule that we have to know that Shmuel Bedoire ki yifta Bedoire, or Jatiaps yifta Bedoire ki Shmuel Bedoire, which means yifta in his, in his day occupies the same position and has the same influence on his generation as Shmuel in his day. Even though Shmuel is considered one of the greatest, greatest Navi, the Gemara says Shmuel is like like Moshe and Aaron together. And Yiftoch was not such a great Navi, or wasn't a Navi at all, he was just a Nasi. Yiftoch Bedoi, the Gemara says, Ki Shmuel Why is this? After all, Yiftach and Shmuel, as we know it, they're not the same kind of person. The reason for that is very closely related to what we're talking about. We have to always remember that when we're learning Torah, when we're learning cases in the Gemara, everything goes back and is based on one principle, that everything is directly coming from Hashem. The whole world is created by Hashem. The whole world is owned by Hashem. And if Hashem assigned this article to Reuven, and this article to Shimon, 
then, then this is a real assignment. And this is the way it has to be. And if we have a generation where the leader is Yiftoch, then that means that Hashem's Hashgokha, Hashem's Brocha to this generation comes through Yiftoch. Exactly the same as Hashem's Brocha comes to his generation of Shmuel. It's exactly the same. Because what really counts and what the center is, is what is the bracha that we get from Hashem. We cannot learn anything, we cannot act in isolation. We have to recognize that we live in Hashem's world. This is the first principle of Torah learning. This is when we can start beginning of open our minds and hearts to understand what we are learning. This is when our learning has a context. What are we talking about? Why all of a sudden I'm talking about lost articles? I, you know, I'm not interested in that. So, coming back to us, you know, home over here. <clears throat> Everyone, every one of us has to recognize you may like one guy, not like the other guy. You may prefer one over the other. This is your business. But that does not allow you to separate from, from anyone. Because once you separate it means that you are not in the environment that, that of the issue. You're on your own. And the, the Hatzloch in learning Torah is only if you are part of the environment of the issue, part of the, of the reality. That's when you, as I said, that's when your mind and heart opens up. That's a prerequisite to the Hatzloch. There are all kinds of people in the world, and therefore there are all kinds of people in the yeshiva. And everyone has their nature, and one has their habits, and one has their chushi. Someone is smart, somebody is less smart, somebody excels in one thing or another thing. That's true, and that's their, that's their individuality, so to speak. But one thing is, is the rating, so to speak, it goes through the entire, the entire environment is that we're all in it together. So now I'm sitting and learning, I'm learning in a reality. I'm not learning in, in, in some kind of a hypothetical environment. If the Torah says, if the donkey of your friend got lost, I know what a donkey is, I know what a friend is. A donkey is not is not some kind of a imaginary being, and a friend is also not some not some kind of imaginary being. I know what, what that means. I can relate to it. So it may seem to one that. If I um, kind of create a little, a little circle around myself, and I relate just to, to I, I, if I stay myself, or I relate just to, to an isolated group, and I don't have to do with the others, uh, maybe you know I'll um, we are smarter, or maybe I'll be, we can be more successful. It's a big mistake. You may be successful theoretically, which I'm seeming successful. But in reality, you don't have a real basis. There is no reality to, to the whole environment. And the first prerequisite is that you have a real environment.
I'm sure that if we will take this thought with us when we sit down to learn, we will see that we can much more readily relate to what we're learning. That's why the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya that every word in the Torah is Rosh and Hashem, the Hashem's will. And even if, even if the case is very far-fetched, practically speaking, nevertheless, it's a reality in Hashem's will. And Hashem's will is, is, is real. We know that what that before we start davening, what are the words that we say before matoivu? Before matoivu, it says from Ariza that you have to say we have to l'riachu komeich, makabel olam mitzvah sasheshin have to l'riachu komeich. That's what we say before davening. So these are, you know, like everything else. You, you just say the words and you go on. But we have to reflect why, what's so significant about it. Davening, like learning, and in a certain sense even more, requires that one have an open mind and an open heart. You cannot just say the words uh, without having your heart and mind involved. When a person thinks of himself as an individual, separate from everybody else, then he doesn't have a reality. There is no mind, there is no heart. When does the mind and heart open up? When he recognizes that there is a whole Kalal Yisrael, there's a whole Jewish nation, there's a whole world, the whole Jewish nation, and this Jew, and he is part of that Jewish nation. Then, he he has an idea, he has, so to speak, what is what's called a, a, a personal uh, identification of who he is and where he comes from, and how he comes to do this dhamma. And that's when this allows his mind and heart to open up. Let us discuss a little bit deeper the concept of an open mind and an open heart.
to take an illustration from a very common circumstance. Let's say somebody is racing, is running, you know, sports, is running in a race. If he knows that the pavement upon which he is running is smooth, without any bumps, without any obstacles, there's no possibility that he's going to hit a, a, um, a ditch, he's going to hit a broken pavement and break his leg. He can completely rely on all the environmental aspect to be taken care of. And all he has to do is concentrate on, on running. Then he can, he can actually concentrate and actually do a good job in running. But if he's concerned at every turn, maybe the next step is there's going to be a rock in, in the way, or there's going to be a ditch in the way, then he can't really safely indulge in what he has to do. Because he has to constantly evaluate what the next step is. The same thing it comes in learning. If one is learning and he is not sure of himself, he's not sure of the of of the of in the environment that he is learning in, then the only way to learn is constantly to evaluate: is this make sense or is this make sense? Do I understand it or I don't understand? It? An open mind learning means that he, uh, when he approaches learning, he knows to start with, before he even starts, that this which he is going to learn is something which is entirely safe to learn. It's entirely true. It's entirely pertinent. It doesn't have to be concerned about evaluation then he can absorb it and, and, and understand it with an open mind and open heart. What is conducive to recognizing that, yes, indeed, this, is, this doesn't need to be, to be um, evaluated before I swallow it, before I learn it? When one is alone, he does not have that support. He is alone, he is always in evaluation. When one is in a group, and he has a complete, um, uh, an complete reality of, of a yeshiva, then one can let go of the guard and know that he can, he, he can open up his mind and heart. What do you mean evaluation? I'll explain to you what I mean by evaluation. I mean, there's a you know, broader thing, but just directly to this. Um, if you are going to eat something, a food that you've never seen before, and you never saw anybody else eat it, and you 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 would want to know whether you can eat it or not. Your concern over here is number one: is it healthy? Is it a lot? Is it edible? And then also, what happens when you eat it? Is it tasty? And and you know some other peripheral things that are associated with it. 
So before you even try it, you have trepidations. You have to study it. Maybe you take a little bit at a time and taste it. It sounds right. It doesn't sound right. But if you see, even if it's a new food that you never tasted, but you see that this is uh, something which is entirely widespread, widespread, and this is the, the food that's being consumed in this, in this country, then you have no trepidations. You eat it. If you don't like it, you don't, you know, that's already a matter of taste. But basically, you, you're not afraid of it. You, you're allowed to come in. The same thing is in learning. When you learn something that you do not have a basis, you do not feel the reality of, of this learning, you are kind of not allowing the whole thing to come in. And the, fir the first thing that you learn, before you even learn it, does it make sense? What is it talking about? Whereas if you see, if you have a environment, you see the holy Shiva learning, then you're not concerned, does it make sense? You're concerned, what is it? I want to I wanna absorb it, I want to learn it. The whole approach is an open-minded approach. This allows for much deeper and clearer understanding. This allowed what we call open-minded and open-hearted understanding. <clears throat> the Yamada says regarding this Indian of learning by yourself, the Yamada has very, very sharp terms about it. And, and it says that learning by yourself is not is not a good thing at all. I don't want to mention, you know, very uh Alabadim, they're very sharp terms. Because this whole union of isolation is is contrary to the principles of Torah. We know that when the Torah was given, even though there was Moshe Rabbeinu and there was Aaron Akoyen and were all the Kenim and all the great scholars and all the great people there, and yet Hashem wanted was waiting that all the people should accept the Torah. And it says that not only should all the people accept the Torah, but there had to be all 600,000, from the highest and to the lowest. Everybody had to be there. And if one would be missing, there would be no Torah. One would be missing, there would be no Torah. Even to the extent that it says that the Torah was given only after Yisroi came to Moshe. Who was Yisroi? Yisroi was a Gair. He was not even Jewish. And the Torah had to be given only after he came. Because the Torah is not a hypothetical, a theoretical book. It's that which describes the, uh, the, cre the, the reality of the world. The, from the creator's perspective. And that's why it has to incorporate everything in the world. And if something is missing, then it, 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 it's not a real thing. So, coming back to ourselves here. It's important that we develop a favorable and a warm relationship with each other. Besides the mitzvah of Avas Yisroel, the Avto Lerecha Tomeicha, and everything else, simply for your individual success, simply for your getting a sense of what it is that you're doing here, to understand what it means, Tznai Merchaz in Betalis, to understand what it means, Hamafkit is Lachaveiro Behem Ayikeli. To understand truly the 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 the, the sense, the nisham of what you're learning, you have to have a a very favorable and a warm attitude towards each other. 
encouraging rather than than disparaging. You know, critical. It's just like we have to lorecha kumecha is a prerequisite for davening. We have to lorecha kumecha in a yeshiva environment is a prerequisite for learning. Otherwise, you can be learning and learning and learning and you have a good head and you know a lot of things, but you kind of feel that everything that you know is all theoretical. There's not reality, it's not real. But Torah has to be real. That's the whole difference of learning Torah versus any other studies. One who has learned Torah and then he is riding the subway. Oh, I never learned about the subway. Doesn't faze him. He knows that this is the same world that God created. That's the same world. It's not any other world. Because at a time when you learn Breshis, Boral, Kimta, Shemayim, Vesorans, he learned it in the real world. He experienced it. There was in his experience a Shemayim and Orans. What? I'm sorry? The Sabi too? Subterranean, right? The fact is that a yeshiva bachar who learned all his life in yeshiva, you know, I mean, a type like all the Torah type. I mean, really, from cradle all the way down to to getting married in yeshiva environment, and then he gets married in Hebrew and Zilf. And he spends a year in the coil as the standard is. And now he has to go out and conquer his little world. So you would think that he would be completely out of place. Where do you start? I, I don't know what the world looks like. It doesn't take him more than two days to get oriented. And he figures it all out. And he does whatever he needs if somebody goes to business. Within a short period of time, he builds a business, or whatever it needs to be, or he has goes on shlichus, he builds a chabad house, whatever it is, he is perfectly well oriented. You would think that he comes there with, with you know, like in today in in school, you know, and they teach you uh, how to walk, how to talk, and how to stand, whatever it is. You would think that he was trained in every one of these. Of, of he, he went through uh, business uh, management school or whatever. And he doesn't even know what, what, that, that such a course exists. How is that? It's very simple. It's simple if you understand what's going on. The whole, his whole lifetime, he lived in a real world. He was in, in the walls of the yeshiva, and he was studying from a book, but it was real. There was real, real friends, a real yeshiva, a real people, a real world, a real God. So when he goes out of the world of yeshiva, it's the same reality. He's not faced by it, and he knows how to deal with it. As a matter of fact, he has a better understanding than those who, who have studied it. The friends that Hashem has put each one of us with, just like Yiftoch Bedoyre, Kishmuel Bedoyre, the same thing, the friend that Hashem has put me with is, exa- is the best friend that Hashem put me with. That's, that's the world He put me, that's the world I live in. I don't live in the world that I create. I live in the world that Hashem puts me in. That's the world by, in which I, I understand. If I really try to, I will understand it. That's the world through which Hashem sends me, sends me His brother.
and that's the world that through which I will be able to do all the good things that I have to do in, the, in my life. In the yeshiva, I can tell you, I mean, Baruch Hashem, I went to the yeshiva. Not a bocha should ever feel isolated. Not a bocha should ever feel that he is trying to isolate himself. Oh, I don't like this. I want to go on my own. No such thing. Should never be. As I said, besides the union of Avas Yisrael, it's completely counterproductive to success in what the yeshiva is supposed to do. Then what you learn and you think you know and you memorize, but it's not real. It's not real. And the story is told of a rov. You know, a rov, one of the principal things that a rov, the basic things that a rov has to know is, is uh, trefus. He has to know whether a chicken is kosher or not. Because there are certain certain internal damages that can happen, blemishes that can happen on a chicken. And if, uh, let's say, if there's a needle piercing through the heart, you find, uh, you know that, <laughs> you know, this is a damage, it's not kosher, even if it were perfectly alive. The same thing, there is a, uh, there's a, uh, you know, there's the lung and there's the, in certain other parts, they're different. So our Rav has to know these shyless cold, uh, the, you know, boss of the hall of mixing meat, you know, kitchen kitchen shyless, he has to be able to answer, that's the first thing. So they came to a Rav with a shyla and a chicken. And he was a Rav, he learned all the dinim from the Sheikh Amaruch. So the, the lady comes with the chicken. And she says, this is the pupik. You know what a pupik is? The, the belly button. <laughs> pupik, whatever it is. You know, this is. So, this is the pupik. He shows it. So he says, well, if pupik is a kurkavon, and, and, and this is a, and this is a kurkavon, then the din is that it's kosher. Huh? Kurkuvan. In Chukhmarek it's not called a pupik, it's often it's called a it's called a kurkuva. Whatever it is, you know. In other words, he he studied everything, what's under Shekhmarak, he remembers it perfectly, but he didn't learn it in the real environment. He never saw a kurkuva. Never saw you know what it what a living chicken is and what a shakta chicken is. And therefore he can pass it only theoretically. But practically speaking, he can't say what it is. This is an illustration, you know, just a, it's like a, like a, a, um, uh, a, 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 a mini story to illustrate what it means when one learns in an unreal situation. When you're learning, you're learning more you know, you learn chesidus, of course. When you start learning chesidus, and you want to understand chesidus, it has to be a real environment in which you learn chesidus. We talk about Avas Hashem and Yiras Hashem. What's Hashem? There has to be some kind of a real, real relationship. So therefore, I urge you very much, I'm saying this is a prerequisite mamash that we have to break through every barrier between each other. You don't have to love each other's peculiarities, but you have to love each other because because that's that's the person that they should put you with. This is your reality. And we cannot maneuver our, our way around and live in 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 in, in a uh, hypothetical situation.
The Rebbe once explained, I think I mentioned it one of the times I've been talking, uh, Yosef HaTzadik was thrown in this dungeon. You all know the story, it's a very recent thing that we learned. He was thrown in this dungeon for completely and complete uh, false accusation, you know, whatever it happened. He accepts, Yosef HaTzadik, that's what he's called, he accepts everything that Rebisha threw at him. He was taken out, thrown, his <laughs> soul, whatever he is, he knows, I'm here now, that's what I have to do. I, you know, whether I belong here or not, that's my, then maybe Rebisha knows where I belong here. Maybe should put me in, that's where I belong. So he was in this dungeon. And Pharaoh got upset with his with his two ministers. And he put, put him into that same dungeon, same prison. And Yosef was assigned to be their servant, taking care and care of them. So Yosef was this little slave boy. And these were secretaries, you know, secretary of the whatever, they were, the kitchen secretary of the, uh, I mean, they were ministerial positions, whatever that means in those days. Sarah Mashkin and Sarah Ifen, they were ministers. Clearly, they were they were men of, 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 of high position in the, in the country, in, in the palace and all that. And they were sitting there, and Moshe was serving, and, and Yosef was there, and there was their servant. And he comes one morning, and he sees that they are that they are depressed. So what would a little servant boy think? Well, I better stay away from them. I have to mind my own business. My business is to bring them their tea. Here's your tea. Good morning. Goodbye. What did Yosef say? Yosef say, hey, these guys are sour. I have to see what I can do. And he approaches these ministers and says, tell me, what's bothering you? Everyone's bothering you. And what would you expect? That the minister would say, hey, you little kid, get out of here. But for some reason, they saw that there was sincerity, there was wisdom in this man, this young kid. And they said, yeah, we'll talk to you. What was actually, what is the lesson? What does what this illustrate to us? That's why Yeshua is called Yeshua HaTzadik. What does this tell us? This tells us that we, even while we're walking, we're doing our thing, we're still aware of the entire world and all that's around us. Everything that Hashem made us experience, everything Hashem put in our way. Because everything has something to do with us. It's our responsibility. Why? Because this is the real world that Hashem put us into. If that's the case in this dungeon in prison, how much more so is it in this yeshiva? Where everybody came voluntarily even though for the same thing. Clearly, each one has to be interested in the other. Clearly, each one has to be helpful to the other, to the extent possible. And if it's not possible, it's not possible. But not to not to carve out one's own path, then you're not living in reality. As I said before, it's it has to do with Thomas is slow, but this is goes beyond that. It has to do with with the sinking in, with the absorption of what you're learning, of the sense that what you're learning is is, is real. Is real. So that when you come out, I come out of the world of the yeshiva, it's the same world. Because you've been living in the real world before too. So, this may sound a little bit like a kind of a Musa speech. But believe me, it's not Musar. This is the reality of Torah. This is what Chassidus tells us what, how we should be, what we are supposed to learn Torah. Every word of Torah the Alter Rebbe says represents 
the rots in Hashem. Doesn't represent a circumstantial incident. You know, something accidentally happened. Everything has a root in Hashem's will. And every situation that we live in is is, is a rots in Hashem. Then we are, we are, we are real, learning real talk. And then the Hashem's help is successful. Hashem's help is successful in privately that we learn and we know what we learn. And we also know how to apply it. We know how to live with it. Because that's what it's all about, really. To be able to perceive the world from a Torah perspective. It's a different world, Maya. Total perspective. An outside world, a totally different world. Totally different world. And that's what we have to carry from the yeshiva. And we have to experience it right here. So, we should all be not clear.